Well, good evening, everyone. This is AJ Monty, Chief Market Strategist with the Market Guys, and we are now beginning our monthly Q&A session that includes the rapid-fire stock analysis portion, which I'll get to in a moment. As usual, I'd like to go over the general markets and catch up on some of the news as I interpret how I believe the news is going to affect the markets moving forward. Uh, before I do that, I, I, I'm going to apologize in advance. There will be times you're going to hear some brief pauses. I'm losing my voice, so I'll need to uh, take a drink from my thermos that I have sitting right next to me so I don't start uh, cracking my voice on you. So just uh, forewarned there on, on the silence. You know, um, I have for the longest time been looking at this trend. This is the diamonds. This is a 20-year monthly chart of the diamonds, and you can see that I've already drawn the trend line there. I simply took my line, went to the very bottom, connected as many of those lows as I possibly could, and then I connected the dots more or less. That is basically how you draw a trend line. Now, if you look back, back here, Back in, uh, what is that, that's February of 2003, I took that trend, you can see I took that low, connected to these lows, projected forward, and you can see that the angle back here from, from February of 2003 all the way up to the beginning of 2008, which is just prior to the to 2008 crash, we had a an angle that was about 45 degrees. Now, a 45 degree angle in price trend <laughs> is actually maintainable. And you know, there was there was a, a lot going on in 2007 that caused the crash of 2008, but that 45 degree angle was a nice comfortable pace for the market to stay on and Along the way, when you have a trend line like that, especially for the investors, you need to keep an eye on the market when it starts breaking down below trends. And let me just explain to you what happened here in 2008 because I do expect the same thing to happen this year and I, I don't want anyone to get caught off guard. When a trend is in the beginning stages of breaking, you will see the price actually breach the trend line. But it doesn't always just collapse as soon as it starts closing below the trend line. What you normally see is an attempt to, let me get back to that, it's usually see an attempt to recover the trend. And so here is the month of January 2008. We closed below the trend line in February of 2008 and then we formed a doji in March with a green candle in April <laughs> and what happened in April was actually the failed attempt to get back on trend and when you see an attempt to get back on trend followed by a failure once again or a second failure this candle and the candles that follow is, is what I call the kiss of death. It's just a, a term that I put out there uh, that describes a failed attempt to get back on trend. And as you can see, history told us that that was a major sell-off. Now, as I progress and look at the following trend that we have right now, you'll see that for, for this trend that actually started in 2009, back here, March of 2009, we kept um, a fairly decent and very steep uh, rally throughout the, throughout the bull market. But if you look at the colors of the candles, and I want you to pay very close attention to this because you need to, you need to train your eye on patterns. Pattern recognition is a very big part of technical analysis. And if, if you remember back in your, in your elementary school days, your high school days, and if you remember some of the exams, especially the intelligence exams, the college exams, even if you've taken an IQ exam, you 
uh, are often tested on your ability to recognize patterns. Now take a look at the patterns here. Do you see anything that kind of pops out at you while looking at this series of upward trend movements here? Well, if you look, the stretches of green as one, two, three, four, five, and then a doji. Then you have one, two, three, four, five there. Then you see one, two, three, four, five, six in a doji. Then you see another one, one, two, three, four, five, and then a red candle. And what do you have here? One, two, three, four. And then now we have one, two, three, four, five. So you notice that the stretches, the, the rallies month after month, generally go from four to six green candles before we start to see the significant corrections or red candles that follow. But notice here, <laughs> the other pattern is one, two, three, four, five, six. We see this here. But what ha what's happening with the volume? <clears throat> right before the big red candle here, we see a series of higher red, uh, green candles, but you notice how the volume drops and then maintains lower levels before you see a spike in the red candle volume. Okay? Look at the most recent stretch of green candles and please note the uh, I'm going to put a trend line here note the angle at which the volume is dropping now we only have about another you know, few days here uh, before we have you know another few days of trading days left in in uh, June before we get into July I really don't think we're going to see any major volume spikes here, I, I don't think this week's volume is actually going to surpass last week's volume. <laughs> that would surprise me. But what I do think is going to happen, and I'll show you the reasons why I'm forecasting this, I do think we're going to make an attempt to break the trend line. And, you know, you know I'd, rather, I'd rather tell everyone you know put your stops in place we can go lower I'd rather be waving the caution flag and be wrong with having stops in place than to wave the caution flag and not have stops in place because if the markets go higher you haven't done anything wrong you're still gonna make money if you have any long positions but it's it's the, the way the condition that the market is in right now it's got me very, very concerned because here we are, we're still rallying, although it's not on strong volume, we're still rallying in the face of what I believe is an economic challenge that I don't, uh, I don't believe we're going to overcome in the near future. Let me give you some of the headlines that I pulled up earlier. <clears throat> Last Friday, I put out an alert talking about the insurgents coming into into Baghdad and approaching Baghdad and I made a forecast that they were going to make a run for the oil fields and uh, today the news came out you can see this coming out of BBC um, there's a key oil refinery that's been seized by the rebels and these are the folks that don't like Americans I believe that this is the Sunni rebels are going to continue to be aggressive on the oil fields because they know this is the way they're going to basically cause an economic collapse. This is their major weapon. They're not going to get on uh, naval warships and, and invade our, our land here, but they can hurt us very, very significantly by uh, superficially and, and actually uh, you know, causing an oil shortage by just turning off the pumps. And you can see that these burning fields here, but... Uh, that's that's just one threat to the US economy the second threat is what's happening on the southern border now for those of you who are living in Canada listening you might think oh AJ uh, what, what's happened to the humanitarian side of you listen I am I am going to help my neighbor just like any of you will in in times of, of trouble but what's happening is we are actually in a state of war and our southern border is wide open right now not now the threat of uh, illegal immigrants coming in and stressing and stressing the taxpayer to to help these people is not the threat that I'm talking about right now. I see an open border to the south with a battle going on 
in in uh, in Iraq. And don't forget, Afghanistan is still is still there. You know, it's still fighting a war. Um, I I see an open border, and this this is amazing how we do not have troops. And yes, I'm exposing a weakness here on a public forum, but I think this is a really big concern because the Al Qaeda leaders uh, have vowed to come back uh, to New York. And I, I tell you, I, as a veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces. I see a real threat here that most Americans are not paying attention to. Now, I don't want to turn this into a political discussion. I'm just telling you how I'm connecting the dots and bringing this back to an investment point of view. How can the markets continue to sustain a bull market like we've had for the past number of years and not have any kind of concern by investors to move off to the sidelines? Now, if you look at what's happened with the oil markets already, I'm going to go to OIH. Look, look at what's happened here in OIH just in the past five months. Uh, it, it went from a low of about 45 up to 56, and and so we're we're up over 15 percent in in the in the oil uh, services stocks just in a matter of four or five months. And if you look at the XLE, which is an ETF. For the energy sector, you're going to see another dramatic move higher, as as uh, investors believe uh, we're going to see much much higher uh, cost of oil down the road. Now again, let's continue to connect these dots. <coughs> Excuse me. If you have higher oil prices, by the way, the inflation numbers don't count oil and they don't count they don't count food into the equation. But <laughs> why? Because the uh, the uh, the federal government believes that these markets are too volatile to measure, so they don't count them in the inflation numbers. Well, you know, the average person, the average investor, could basically go shopping with a calculator, remembering what prices were, you know, last year, and figure out what the percentage increase is on food. This is real inflation. And the average consumer who's not in the stock market and can care less about the stock market has less expendable income, and therefore they're spending more on food. To give you an example, uh, my wife had a party. It was a baby shower for my for my uh, daughter-in-law, and she told me she was shocked when she looked at the uh, at the price increase on on cheddar cheese. Now I, I don't do the shopping in the household, but when she told me. It's up over 25% in two months. Well, I told her that's food inflation, and be prepared for it. You know, she she is a shopper, and she she is very in tune to the cost of food. Now, again, that's my wife doing the shopping, but there's a lot of people out there that are feeling that pinch. What does that mean? What does that really mean? When people are concerned about not having enough money at the end of the month to pay for food or or gas in their car. They're certainly not going to go to the movie theater and, and, and buy movie tickets. They're not going to be going on holiday so quickly. They're going to be saving their money to, to really put together a budget for the rainy days. And they're certainly not going to be investing in the stock market. People tend to hold back, and that's what causes recessions. That's, that's a real threat to our market is a recession, maybe even a depression, because you're going to see that plus uh, interest rates start to go up, which is going to compound a downward spiral into the market. Now, again, if I'm wrong, but you're still protecting yourself, that's, hey, I'm doing my job. That's what I'm doing. My job is to teach risk management. And if you learn how to properly manage the risk that's, that's attacking your account, then you keep riding the waves higher. But just make sure you get you set your stops in place. We're going to show you how to set the stops correctly. A couple of questions came in. George uh, Popoff asked me if I use trailing stops, and and I told him I do, but I use manual stops. Let me show you what's happening. Let's. I don't have a position in XLE, but let's say I did have a position in XLE. Here you can see that recently the price has broken out over the all-time high from from April 1st of 2008. There is the ultimate high until recently. Now that the market has broken over that high, this horizontal line becomes my support level. 
So if I had a row reversal point down here, let's say I got in back here, but I put my stop down below 80, and now it's broken out over a new high, I'm going to move my stop from, say, 79 to 89. I'm just going to naturally and manually move that up. Now, if the market pulls back and bounces and then breaks through this high, let's say, then I move my stop up from 89 to maybe up there around 100. And I continue to step up with the price of the stock. <clears throat> if, you, if you're using a trailing stop based on a percentage, you might be getting stopped out too early. And I'll go over some of the examples when we start looking at your stocks. So this, this is going to be my, I guess you're going to say my, my baseline for today's presentation is going to be risk management and, and looking at some of these stocks in, in such a way that, okay, if you get involved, then maybe you, know, maybe you should protect along the way. You absolutely should. Now, let's, I just want to look at a couple of the markets, SPY, Spiders, here's my role reversal point. I put this out in the weekly market report. If you don't get the weekly market report, then I would suggest you go to the Market Guys website and just enroll as um, as a, a member, and you'll get that sent to you. Or you can go to the Market Guys Facebook page, and I post it there as well. Every single week, I post it. Uh, this line is the horizontal line that I I marked as the role reversal for the spiders. If you look at the cues, this is the Nasdaq market you're going to see I have my lines in place here again this is the role reversal that we have to watch out for and you know this role reversal line is where you know if we start breaking down below that role reversal then all bets are off for any new long positions you know there was a there was a question that came up um, who was it was it George uh, let's see someone asked me a question about the MACD um, I can't remember who that was. If I use the MACD, um, I I don't use the MACD. I could teach you everything about the moving average, convergence, divergence. But what I what I do instead of need, you know using an indicator to determine how far a stock is from the moving average, I just eyeball it. I mean, look at here's this is a, a 200 uh, day moving average, but I could eyeball the distance between where the moving average is and the price and I could see there's a wide divergence there I could look at it now and say okay there's still a wide divergence so there's a rubber band effect that could easily pull the market back to the moving average so I don't need a moving average to tell me when that's happening and if I don't want to use a, a, a 200 day moving average I could shorten the moving average and using a I could use a 20 or even a 50 and still do the same thing I just measure the distance with my eye based on past history of where the stock has been and I could determine if it's overextended or not All right now uh, that's the cue so we have to watch out we have to watch out for that now the VIX and then I'm going to start moving into into some of your stocks the volatility index is starting to pivot higher and let's go back to the monthly chart this this horizontal line actually goes back 30 years even though this chart is 20 years old um, it goes back even further to a 30-year low this this low VIX number right around ten dollars is the 30-year low and if you look at where we wound up this week look at the low for the VIX we wound up at 10.34 which is near pennies away from the 30-year low this line here is my projected trend for the VIX and if you're new to the VIX you have to understand that this is a contrarian indicator when the VIX starts moving up the S&P will start moving down the the VIX is actually a leading indicator volume is the most important leading indicator VIX is second most important so when you're analyzing your stocks you need to be keeping the volume in mind and keeping an eye on the volatility index very very important that you watch those those two things okay uh, let's see uh, yes uh, Darmesh I will be uh, I will be individually uh, I will be looking at individual stocks here in a moment I just go over the market review first to make sure that we are in line with with the big picture okay <clears throat> so 
now that we've gotten the bad news out of the way with regard to the economy and, and what's happening in Iraq, how could that possibly be an opportunity? And I don't want to be an opportunist at the expense of you know, a, a wartime condition. I'm just trying to show everyone how to, number one, protect their positions, but number two, when things start to reverse, and, and notice how I say when, when the VIX starts going up, and when the S&P starts going down, you have to be very, very quick to uh, reverse your positions. The first thing you need to do when this starts to break is you need to move to cash as quickly as possible. If you look at the diamonds, even on a weekly chart, you could see here that we, we have this role reversal here. If you look at, I believe it was a Russell 2000, if I'm not mistaken. I was looking at the Russell 2000. Maybe it was a daily chart. Let's see. Hold on. Yeah, it was a Russell 2000. Um, today, the Russell 2000 showed a bearish engulfing pattern. So keep an eye on that. You have a bearish engulfing pattern. Uh, I think what could happen is is this right here. It'll, it'll start to move back to, to retest that line. The Russell 2000 is a broader-based index than the Dow and it's uh, more broad based than the S&P so I, that's a good that's a good symbol to put on your watch list as well okay so who would like to be the first one in with a stock okay uh, Jim wow fast to the keyboard there what about JCP that's JC Penny for those of you in Canada if you could I'm going to analyze the US stocks because my platform is set up that way I won't be able to look at your Canadian stocks unfortunately uh, we do that on the Scotia presentations. JCP, uh, Jim is in at 906. All right. Now, Jim, uh, look at what I have here. The, this was my former trend for JCP. And if I extend this out, you'll see that it looks to me like there's a kiss of death forming right here. If you're in at 906 and you do not have a stop somewhere below this low, right there then I would suggest you put a stop in uh, somewhere below uh, what is that below 827 and uh, calculate whether or not that's your uh, that's your one percent rule but I would not be a buyer of JCP right now if you're in it I would put a stop in and let the stock uh, take let the stock price determine your you know whether or not you stay in you see uh, that there this uh, diagonal line is the 200 day moving average and so if it breaks down below the 200-day moving average and below that support level, then again, all bets are off because you have a gap down here at around $6 that could very easily fill. So you don't want to take risk on, on that one if you don't have to. Okay. Uh, Ron has O-N-N-N. -N -N. He doesn't own it. And he asked me if I uh, would recommend the stock and what would be a good entry point. Okay. Let's take a look at O N N N. Is that uh, okay? <coughs> All right. Looking at this, <coughs> I could see recently bounced off of the 200-day moving average. Now remember, Ron, we just looked at the broad-based index and, or actually the indices, and we're determining that it's overextended and that there's a risk of it going down. So you you don't want to take an aggressive long position in anything uh, not at all in fact especially in this one here's why this stock has recently filled the gap just last week it filled this this gap back here and 80 percent of the time after a gap fills the stock will generally reverse that's number one number two let me erase these lines and help Ron with this a little bit more Number two, and this is audience participation right here. I'm going to draw my trend line. There it is. The stock's in an upward trend. But what's happening to the volume? Can anyone tell me? Who wants to answer that? What's happening to the volume, and what would that be signaling? The vo what is the volume signaling? Okay, Gil says it's decreased. Sheldon says it's dropping. Robert says it's dropping. And when a stock is going up and the volume is dropping down, what does that tell us? Uh, Jeff says volume going down means buying is slowing. 
and that's absolutely right. The buyers are becoming less motivated. Look at the look at the volume down here. You see how the volume is dropping? So I would say this is uh, in the beginning stages of a reversal to go lower. So be really careful with that. I, I really don't feel good about buying this, even if it bounces off of this trend line, uh, simply because of that volume. So I, I, would, I would stay away from that one if, uh, if, if you could um, there. All right, so now let's go to the next. Uh, we looked at Ron's. Let's look at Darmish. Uh, NGLS. Uh, Darmish, are you owning this stock? Are you looking at buying the stock? NGLS. Add, add some comments there to, to help me with that as well. Stock spiked up recently. Uh, let's see. Darmish looking at buying. Okay. Let's, uh, let's take a look at this one more closely. This stock has recently, uh, you know, it broke out of, uh, out of a minor resistance point and it pulled back. Uh, this, this is a very interesting uh, move here because, and Darmesh, I, I don't know what the news was on this, but chances are on, uh, on the 19th of June, looks like big news came out on this one. But, and here's the big but. There was absolutely no follow through. This stock went all the way up to looks like 84 and then the very next day opened lower and continued lower on extremely high volume. So I don't know what the deal is here but there was no follow through whatsoever. And if you look at today's volume, today's volume is only a third of what it was yesterday. So I, I can't even get myself to even think about buying this one unless I start to see a bounce uh, off of that newly established role reversal point. So if you do see a green candle tomorrow and you still feel that you want to buy it, I would suggest you put a stop right below today's low. So that's going to be, uh, I would put a stop, let me see, today's low was 69.08. I would put a stop at 68 and a half if you buy it uh, tomorrow in a green candle. Uh, but that that's a very odd uh, couple of candles right there because there's no follow through. And it looks like whatever the news was, it came out during the day uh, and not uh, after the market closed or, or before the market opened. So that's uh, that's that, that what would have happened here if, if the news came out during uh, during the day, uh, excuse me, uh, during the close of the market, it would have gapped up most likely here, and then the next day it would have gapped down. So it would have been a, it would have been an evening star that would have been a bearer signal. So I, again, I, I'm having a hard time finding any uh, new long positions at this particular point. Now John says NYMT. He's holding it right now. Let's look at NYMT. And uh, uh, John, I would uh, here. Here's my question to you. Okay, um, John is holding it now. John, I'm going to put you on the spot, and I'm going to ask you where you have your uh, stop uh, loss order in, because I have a clear place where I would put it. But I want to see where yours is first. You could just type that in there. If you don't have a stop, don't be embarrassed. Just tell me, because then I'm going to tell you where to put your stop anyway. Okay. Um, all right, we don't, John. Uh, we have a little bit of a delay, so if you're typing that in, uh, I don't, I don't see it yet. Okay, okay. John is holding as a hedge against Iraq problems and good dividends. Okay, well, don't don't be fooled by good dividends, because whatever the dividends are, I don't care if it's fifteen percent. If um, if you have a stock that's paying you a fifteen percent dividend and this stock goes from $8 to $6, then you're going to lose a lot more than 15% in the price of the stock. So don't get trapped into long positions because the dividends are paying high. That's, that's very dangerous. What I would do, John, even if you're holding it as a hedge, um, I see a clear roll reversal point. And again, I'm going to ask the audience to help me identify where that might be. Look at, look at the previous highs. Look at pivot points. Look to the right of the chart. Who can tell me where I should be drawing 
my roll reversal line. I'm going to put that in here in a second. And okay, who wants to tell me where they would draw their roll reversal line? All right, Denise, I got yours. Paul, I got yours. All right. All right, everyone's got the majority of the people have answered came in with $8.00. Seven dollars and ninety-five cents. Eight dollars. Eight dollars. Eight dollars. Eight dollars. That's exactly where I would put it. I would put it right at the eight-dollar mark. Here is a bearish engulfing pattern that formed a resistance point right here, and four days later, the stock broke out over resistance, and then the stock pivoted and went up from this point right there. So here's your roll reversal line at around eight. So John, what I would do is I would put my stop. I would I would even give this a little bit. You could even put your stop way down here. I would put a stop probably around 780. That way you have this roll reversal protecting you and you have this secondary support level. If it breaks down below both of those support levels, again, all bets are off and now you got to get out of the position. So that's where I would put my stop even if you have this as as a hedge. Okay? So hopefully that helps you out. Okay, let's see. We have some more stocks. I'll tell you when the refresh with the symbols. I'm, we have a good enough selection right now. <coughs> Lana says, what do you think about taking a position in KORS? Uh, let's take a look at uh, Michael Kors Holdings. Um, this is uh, interesting because you have a roll reversal point here. But this roll reversal point still wouldn't, uh, it still wouldn't fill the gap. So here's where I would draw the roll reversal point. I'm going to erase this, and I'm, I would put it right at the gap fill point. So it's pretty close to this roll reversal. When a gap, if, it, if there's an upward gap and a stock fills that gap, 80% of the time after the gap fills, it will reverse. So it looks as though the stock could still come down and test that support level right around 83. But, Lana, what I'm seeing here, and this might be a good thing for you if you're thinking about buying, is that we have a series of red candles with you know, a green candle hammer stuck right in the middle. But this is, a, this is close to a doji or a spinning top. And that will most often act as a pivot point. So, if you decide to buy it on a green candle tomorrow, and that's the key, you would have to wait for the green candle. Even if you buy it at 89, a little bit higher, let's say you buy it at 89, I would put my stop somewhere below 82. And that would give you a $7 risk per share on the calculation. And you might think, well, that's, AJ, that's, you know, 8, 9% uh, price difference. Just don't buy a lot of shares. So you could let a stock actually drop uh, with a very strong percentage but still only lose a small percentage of your account if you're sizing the position correctly. So if you do buy it, I would wait for a green candle and I would put my stop immediately below this uh, roll reversal support and put it right, right around $81, $82 or, or a little bit below that. Give it some room. Okay? All right. Now Ron says GSAT. I'm going to try to do as many of these as I can because this hour goes very quickly. GSAT, uh, Ron does not own it. I would, Ron, I would not be buying it, uh, mainly because this is very close to a hanging man. That's a bearish signal. When you have a hammer at the, at the upper portion, that's usually bearish. So I, I would not buy that one. However, here's where I would be a buyer. I would be a buyer if the stock comes down to 320, 330 and then bounces off of here, then I would. Um, these cheap stocks you have to be very careful with because the other reason I'm not really crazy about buying this is because if you look at the distance between the moving average and where the stock is, there's a wide divergence. And if I move this out to a weekly chart, you're going to see the more dramatic effect. You know, look at it now. It, you know, this. The more I look at this and the more I scale back, let's look at a monthly chart, you know, Look at this one here. You have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 months in a row of green candles. This thing is long overdue for a red candle. 
And now, don't be fooled. This this is a monthly uh, chart. Yeah, the volume is going up on the monthly, but look at what's happening up here. You you would have a major role reversal resistance area up around six dollars. So that's the only amount of space that you're going to have to play before this thing corrects. So up around six dollars, and then if you go back to the weekly chart, you can see how dramatic of a move this is. Now again, it's it's only Monday, so this volume for the weekly bar is going to be small, obviously, but it doesn't look like to me on the weekly chart that this volume is going to surpass last week's volume. So again, you got to be really cautious with that one. Okay, Alan uh, recently bought CAG at twenty nine eighty five. Let's put in CAG for Alan. Recently bought it at uh, 29.85 it took a huge drop I have a stop set around 27.55 okay now <coughs> Alan the good thing is you are at a role reversal support level or pretty close to it I'm, I'm kinda uh, taking the, the mean between the two these highs and this low so I eyeballed the low first and you can see that this stock has pretty uh, volatile price action. Uh, you can see that it falls off very quickly. It builds up over a couple of weeks or so, drops dramatically, builds up a couple of weeks or so, drops dramatically again. Now that you're at the 2812 uh, support level, you tell me your, your stop is 27.55. I think that is the perfect place for you to set your stop. Now that's on the weekly chart. Let's go to the daily chart. Now hopefully you're, you're seeing this. I I really like this one. Out of out of the stocks we we've seen so far, these are the kind of stocks that I like to shop for because it gapped down. You know, right here uh, on the 18th of June, the stock gapped down. Now, if you're interested in learning more about gaps, let me go to. The Market Guys site, and I want to show everyone where to find the video. Go to the Market Guys, click on the video tab, and there is a video that talks about trading the gap right here. Please review that. This is this one little video is going to be something you'll be able to use for the rest of your life. It explains the percentages and 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 price movement of gaps and how they work. And generally, what happens is when a stock gaps down. Or gaps up on average it takes three to five days before the stock will try to pivot on average three to five days right now we have one two three we're on the fourth day and today is a doji I think that looks like a green candle doji Hold on, or a very very small spinning top slightly slightly green hold on hold on Alan yeah slightly green but look at the volume we had big volume on this red candle, pretty good volume on this red candle, slightly lower uh, volume on that red candle, dramatically low volume now. Now here, audience participation again, when a stock is going down and you see the volume dropping, what does that tell us about the sellers? What does that tell us about the sellers? I want to be the first one to answer. Okay, Jeff got it right. Sellers are losing steam. Exactly. When the stock broke down below the moving average, sellers got excited. They kept selling for three days in a row, but today the sellers are slowing down. The volume is about half of what it was just on Friday, and we have a spinning top. I love these because this is where I would be a buyer. I, I generally buy on these because, number one, it, it – it most likely will try to make a move up to fill this gap up here, but it's close enough to that support level, okay? It's close enough to this support level so I could maybe buy it at 29 and set a stop at 28 or 27 and a half. If I'm going to be a buyer, I'm not going to give this one a whole lot of room to hurt me. So I think this is a good bet just to play it on a bounce. I wouldn't be a long-term investor but I'd certainly be a shorter term trader. Why wouldn't I be a longer term investor? Because look at the weekly chart. Investors will go crazy trying to hold on this one. You know, it might be up a little bit, but since since uh, three years ago, 
but not by much. I mean, you could have bought it a couple of years ago for twenty six dollars. It's only trading twenty eight, twenty nine. Not a huge return. So, but for the trader, see, this stock has enough legs to it. These upward and downward movements are called legs. There's enough volatility in the legs for a shorter term trader to to trade this one. So if you're not, if you're just brand new to trading, I would suggest you put this one on your watch list and track it. In fact, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to track this one uh, with Alan. Uh, let me put this. I'm I'm going to put this right on there, and I'm going to track that one. C A G. There you go. I just added it to my to my watch list, and I'm going to watch it with everyone else. There it is. Okay. Uh, now, stock symbols got kind of got washed away with the question. So, uh, if uh, if you can, please resubmit your stock symbols, and I'll keep going here. We still have 20 minutes to go. I can get a lot of stocks analyzed then. Okay. Anna says Apple. A A P L. Let's take a look. Hold on. All right, now, this is an interesting story. Uh, I do believe in the last in the last open house, there were a couple of recommendations. I, I did mention how I thought Apple would drop, and, and it has recently. But let me explain to you what happened with Apple. It gapped up from here to here, as you can see. I'll zoom in here. And the stock proceeded to go up. Now, it went up with excitement because of the news that was released of a seven for one stock split. Can anyone tell me why the stock would drop after the stock has split seven for one? I know that's a pretty detailed question, but I, I really want everyone to understand why the stock is dropping and why I think it will continue to drop. Can anyone tell me why the stock might drop after a split? See, some people think, oh, it's split. Now it's cheaper. I can buy more shares. And then, Yeah, you'd be right. Okay, Gerald says, yeah, institutional holders will tend to sell. That's the exact correct answer. Let me, let me play, uh, play out a scenario for you. Imagine that each and every one of us bought, let's say we bought a uh, million dollars worth of Apple prior to the split. Okay, each, each and every one of us are institutional money managers. And each of us have been holding Apple for a long time. We have about a million dollars of our investor clients' money in the stock, and now the stock splits seven for one. What happens to the risk in that portfolio? Can anyone tell me what happens to the risk? Let's see. Anyone tell me? All right, Robert, you're right. Avi, you're right. Brenda, you're right. Okay, but what what happens to the risk? Robert and Gerald are, are correct. The risk goes up, and Jeff, you're right as well. The risk just went up. Remember, each and every one of us have the same dollar amount in the stock, but actually, our risk exposure has increased sevenfold because the number of shares we hold now have increased by seven. And you might say, well, AJ, the, the stock isn't going to move as big a percentage uh, now that it's, it's trading, trading cheaper prices. No, that's not right. Apple will still trade a dollar, two dollars a day. And you magnify that by seven, and whether or not you believe that's true, the risk managers at these firms are going to go and, and review the risk formulas for their positions and they will require that the money managers lighten up on the position because they're holding too many shares. And that's just the way it is. And so what happens is you look at the, you look at the, uh, the selling uh, going on, you start to see the increase in, in selling. Look at the weekly volume. I'll show you here. Hold on. Look at the weekly volume. See how back here and here the volume increased even though it was going up because the institutions were selling as the stock was going up, they were they were scaling out. That's what the term is. That's the jargon. They were scaling out of the position as the stock rallied, just after and prior to the stock split. But now there's still a lot of people that continue to hold. And look at the volume of of the weekly volume on Apple. It's starting to dramatically drop. 
So if you're in Apple, I would either buy puts or put your stops really, really tight. My stop would probably be right. Well, we're, we're real close to getting stopped at already. But I would, I would put your stop just below, just below 91, and I wouldn't even look back at that one. Okay, let's see. S. Uh, hold on, we got some more stock symbols. Roger, let me pick some people that haven't picked yet. Roger, uh, I see your stock. SCTY, could you please tell me what your position is on this one? <coughs> this was a position that uh, we have in the Oracle. <coughs> okay, let's see. Let me let me just pull something up. I want to I want to show everyone something. I don't normally make this public, but I I want to give you the good and bad news for the uh, for the equity traders out there. Hold on, let me let me move this out of the way. Let me see if I could pull this up here. Hold on. I'm going into my spreadsheet folder, and I want to look at the TEO scorecard. This is the actual scorecard for um, for the equity option, uh, the equity oracle. And we got stopped out in DOG, uh, which was the only one we've taken a loss on so far. The rest we've been trailing the stops and so on and so forth. So if you're an equity trader, your spreadsheet should look a lot like this. Now, up until this one here, I was I was on track to get 100% percentage of accuracy, but that's unrealistic to be able to hold 100% accuracy rate throughout the year. We're currently tracking 94.73%. Now, the uh, the option traders, I do believe we took a position in SCTY, I want to show you what I'm seeing here. Number one, we see a long stretch of green candles. We call this a stale green light. Okay, I'm, this was a. I think this one was slightly red here. Let's see. Now that's green. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have nine green candles in a row and we're long overdue for a red candle. Look at the volume, steady decrease in volume as the stock goes vertical. So I'm bearish on this one. Okay, Roger, what what are you doing with this? Did you take a position? Let's see. You're selling a put? Oh, I wouldn't do that. No, I wouldn't sell a put. Not at all. Because uh Roger, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but which put did you sell? Uh let me help you more with that. Uh, because this stock is getting ready to drop, and if you've already sold the put, you're probably making money. So I would say take your take your position, um, take your profits rather, and get out of that one. Oh, you're looking at selling a put? No, don't do that. Don't do that. Because you because look, let's let's start from the very basics and how we look at the stocks. Remember the pattern recognition I was telling you about? <clears throat> when in the stock's history over the course of the year? Have we had this many green candles in a row? Well, the answer to that is never this year. Let's go back and look at the weekly chart. All right. Now we've had some pretty dramatic moves in this stock, but look, look at the row reversal. Look at the weekly chart and how close we are to that resistance point right here. What we did in SCTY is we sold a credit call spread. That's bearish. That's what the option traders did. We sold the 75 calls. We bought the 85 calls. That's a bearish strategy. We're expecting this stock to pull back. If you're selling a put, that is a bullish strategy. So I would get out of that, take the profit, and then get in line with maybe selling a credit call spread and take, a, take another profit there. Okay, so hopefully that helped you out. All right, let's go back. Clock is ticking here. We got 11 minutes to go. SWN. This is coming from Tom. Tom is in SWN. Oh, sorry, hit the wrong symbol there. SWN and Tom is in this one at 35. Congratulations. <clears throat> Here's a weekly chart. And now we see the stock has been up with trend. Tom has been in this one since it was down at 35 down here. 
Okay. Uh, Tom, I'm going to ask you where's your cell stop, and then I'm going to ask the rest of the audience where the role reversal line should be drawn. Let me zoom in here. Can anyone tell me where the role reversal line should be drawn? And then I'm also looking for Tom's answer there. Okay, got that one from Vlad. Oh, Tom doesn't have a stop. Okay, Tom, I'm not going to scold you too much, but you're going to have to put a stop in. And, and the audience so far, Vlad, Michael, Lisa, Tim, Robert, you're pretty close. No, Robert, oh, I see what you're talking about, Robert. Brenda, you're right. Paul, you're right. Uh, Lloyd, you're right. Brian, you're right. Gerald, you're right. Jeff, you gave me a range that you'd be right. Denise, Larry, uh, Lana, and Keith. Okay, here's the role reversal line. I look for a former resistance line that will match a current support level. See this V? This, yeah, I'll draw the V first. Let's draw the V. This is the pivot point. Boom. From there to there. There is the V. You see it? At the bottom of the V is the actual pivot point. Now, if, I, if I'm going, what I have to do is I have to eyeball that bottom. I have to eyeball that support and then draw it to the left. Does that support level match up with any previous resistance levels? Yes. Not quite to the penny, but this bearish engulfing pattern is a resistance line. So this, this support level is right around 44. It's almost exactly at 44. Okay, so all of you who answered 44 are correct. And Tom, what I would suggest you do, and it's really not that far away, I would put my stop somewhere around 43 and a half. I would put my stop right there. So you'll still lock in your profit. You might have to give back a little bit of profit to keep in the stock. But I think that's a very safe bet to put your stop at 43 and a half. Because now as I go from my weekly chart to my daily chart, you're going to see something else pop off the screen. Uh, this, oh, that's very close to a bearish engulfing pattern here today. So I think what's going to happen is the stock is probably going to try to make a bounce. Uh, but if it drops below that support, Tom, I would get out, take your profits and run. And be thankful that you're that you're up, uh, you know, nine dollars on uh, on a thirty-five dollar stock. Okay, keep going with uh, Coco. Lisa recently draw a dramatic drop in price due to a bad news. Large gap above, but too risky. Coco's a cheap stock. I trade that once in a while, in and out. <coughs> this one uh, right now, we we got in back here. Actually, we traded Coco. And this this was my target price. And when we got up very close to that, most of us bailed out. I don't know if you still have it. But this stock is notorious for filling gaps. And what happens is this is a pretty large gap on the bad news that Lisa was talking about. But in the process of it moving up to fill a gap, what did it do? It left another gap. So this puts us in a very tough position because we're caught between two gaps. So what I would do with Coco is I would first wait for this gap to fill before getting in. So in other words, this is the pattern that I would look for. Let me draw this for you. I would expect this to come down, maybe even test the low again, but most certainly fill the gap. Any kind of a green bullish pattern it could be a hammer pattern. It could be a bullish engulfing pattern. Any kind of a green pattern, a buy signal here, would allow me to get in at a pretty cheap price. But I would put my stop below this low here. I would put my stop below 30 cents. So if I bought it at 40 cents after the bounce, I'm risking about, uh, about 15 cents probably. And then my target would be up here around 85 cents. And you... Don't don't let Coco fool you. This thing could actually double from this price point right here. It could easily go from 40 to 80. That this stock has that kind of volatility. Now, I wouldn't put a whole lot of money into this just because it's cheap. Doesn't mean you have to go out there and buy you know 100,000 shares of this stock. Don't do that. Have fun with it, but make sure you're using the one percent rule 
to manage your risk. Again, if, if any newcomers you want to learn about the one percent rule, go to the Market Guys website again. Click on the uh, click on the video page. And where's the one percent rule? It's in here somewhere. It's probably at the top. There it is, right here. You click on the one percent rule and you learn how to size your position even with the cheap stocks. Okay, I'm going to take two more. Two more. Let's see. Patricia, uh, let me look at Patricia, is looking at SCHW, that's Schwab. All right, let's take a look. Patricia, what, what do you have in mind there? What are you looking to do? SCHW. I, uh, I worked with uh, Chuck Schwab some years ago, and uh, I know this company intimately. This is uh, Broadband. Oh, this is the, that's not the ticker symbol, though, that Patricia gave me. SCHW. Okay, there it is. Now, uh, Patricia bought it at 24. No stop. Oh, Patricia, we're gonna have to, I'm gonna have to talk to you about no stops. Okay, I'm just kidding, but I'm not kidding at the same time. I would take you. I would take profits on this one. If, and here's why. A couple of reasons. We are at a roll reversal point. You see that? There. No, it's not roll reversal. That's just pure resistance right there. So the stock has gone up. There was a bullish engulfing pattern here. The stock went up, and now the volume is dropping. See the volume drop? Today's volume drop, although it doesn't look like much. Let me zoom in there for you. That is probably a 20% drop in volume today from Friday. So here, there's a couple things you could do. You could sell out of the position entirely and take your $3.28 profit. That's number one. You could take maybe sell half the position. Maybe sell half the position. That way you're taking some of the profits, and that way it creates cash so that if the stock drops back down to the 200-day moving average around 25, maybe you'll have another chance to buy more if it bounces off here. But remember, if you sell half, you're still exposing yourself to some risk. All right. If you look at Charles Schwab's stock on a weekly chart, uh, something is very interesting is happening, and, and this is where my caution flag goes up. Can I'm going to zoom in here, and as I'm zooming in, can anyone tell me what type of pattern looks like it's forming here? Can anyone tell me who are the who are the advanced chartists out there that can tell me what they're seeing? Can anyone tell me a pattern? Okay, Sheldon, you're right. Okay, anyone else? Oh, look at this. Oh, good students. Yes. Jeff, Patricia, Gerald, Paul. All right, Patricia, now remember, this is your stock, and you answered the right uh, answer. And everyone who typed in head and shoulder is, is correct. Everyone. Now, again, going to the Market Guys website, go to the head and shoulder top. Head and shoulders top right here. Go and look at that. Let's, let's zoom in to you. Look. Look at this example. You see this right here? I'm going to try to do this. I don't know if I could do this side by side. Can, can I do this? Let's see. I'm going to try to see. There we go. Now, look at my example of a head and shoulder here. Left shoulder. Right here. Left shoulder. There's the left shoulder right there. See it? Where's the head? There's a head right there. The head is higher than the left shoulder. Is that what's happening? Yes. We have a head right there, higher than the left shoulder. What's happening here is a right shoulder. And lo and behold, what do we have? A right shoulder. Now, a lot of people think a head and shoulders pattern happens in a series of days. It doesn't. In fact, a head and shoulders pattern takes weeks, if not months, to complete. So if this stock starts going down, and I think it very well could, what would happen to complete this is you would see a drop in price to create the right shoulder, but this this whole support level down here becomes the neckline. Okay, again, see the, the, the primary support and the secondary support would be the neckline right here. So what I see happening is this is a possible top forming pattern and if it breaks down below that support, then all bets are off. Now, Patricia, you bought the stock at the support level. 
So I, I would say that's another reason why I feel really good about taking a profit because Charles Schwab stock trades very much in line with the Dow Jones Industrial Averages because they are a brokerage company. When the market drops, like I think this is going to do, people tend not to trade as much. And Charles Schwab generates a very, very large uh, part of their revenues in trading commissions. So if people stop trading because the market's dropping, Charles Schwab's uh, stock will drop. So I've uh, cut that right down to the split second end, and uh, we just ran out of time. We didn't run out of fun, and we certainly didn't run out of stock symbols. I really want to appreciate, uh, I appreciate everyone's time today. I hope you had a good time. I hope you got a lot of good stock ideas. Uh, remember, CAG is the stock that I added to my list, and hopefully each and every one of you have realized the importance of putting your stops in place. So I'm going to sign off for now. This is AJ Monty, Chief Market Strategist of the Market Guys. We'll talk to you soon. Have a good night. Bye-bye.